Hi, so imaginative drawing can be a very big mystery for uh, many people, especially if uh, you are an artist who draws mostly from uh, using reference. You just draw from observation. So today I am going to introduce you to the four drafu chambers of imaginative drawing. Hi, my name is Luis Escobar. I'm a storyboard artist on The Simpsons television show. I've been working on the show for over 25 years now, and I'm here to empower you. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about here is something that assumes that you've got some type of proficiency drawing already. Uh, that means that you have, in some way, shape, or form, s control over the marks you make. I don't believe that you need to have a mastery over academic realism to actually start drawing from your imagination. And the reason I say this is because some of my favorite artists growing up were cartoonists and none of these artists would be considered masters of academic art. Cartoonists like Charles Schultz. Now Charles Schultz, you can see his art here. Um, I don't think anybody would say that, oh look at his, uh, that's not Charles Schultz, but this. Uh, look, at, look at how academically perfect the way Charles Schultz draws. Uh, that This isn't, that's not what you see Charles Schultz for. However, he did obviously have some sort of control over his artistic abilities. He knew perspective. He knew how to draw solid. He knew how to draw clearly. He knew how to draw emotionally, emotional care, uh, em uh, he, how, how to emote through his characters. So he's an example of somebody that isn't a master academic, but is, he's a solid cartoonist and a good draftsman in his own way. Uh, another person that I greatly admire and love his work is Gary Larson from The Far Side. Again, not a master academic drawing. Uh, his drawings are actually quite goofy, but there is solidity. There is perspective. You can tell that you, you could understand the spatial relationship between people. There's overlapping shapes. There's foreshortening. Um, so there is a certain amount of mastery over drawing itself. Okay, and then another example of one of my all-time favorite artists that wouldn't be considered uh, an academic master, but is still an amazing, fun draftsman and cartoonist, is Sergio Aragonés. He's most famous for his Mad Magazine uh, cartoons on the in the corners of the of the margins, but he's also just an amazing cartoonist. He's able to do so much with his little cartoons, his little comics. His uh, art is extremely clear. He, his drawings are very well draft. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing cartoonist. He's able to do some crazy stuff like that. I mean, he's just amazing. So, when I talk about imaginative drawing, I'm talking about being able to do something like this, like Charles Schultz, like Sergio Aragonés, like Gary Larson, okay? But I'm not talking just about cartoonists that are doing really cartoony stuff. I'm also talking about guys that could draw comics, superhero comics, things like that. Uh, people like Frank Frazetta who could, who could draw very representational stuff from his imagination. So I'm not limiting it to just cartoons. I am not limiting it to just realism, just the whole gamut of imaginative drawing. Now when I think of, um, uh, I think um, there are some artists, uh, very good artists, uh, um, especially those who can draw from observation in, in amazing ways who are great admirers of an artist like Kim Jong-gi. And Kim Jong-gi is famous for just starting in a corner and from, from his imagination just drawing these amazing things. Now, he's an amazing artist and he's kind of like an outlier. By outlier, I mean he's very unique in that most professional artists cannot do what he does. 
but he's been training since he was a little kid to um, his, his mind and his memory. And uh, you can get to this uh, point uh, of ability, if you want, from your imaginative drawing. But it does require a lot of memorization. And I'm going to be talking about that too. So uh, let's begin. Okay, so in order to draw from your imagination, you have to go through the four Drafu chambers. And Drafu, if you don't know, is the theme that I tend to use. Drafu um, is a play on the word Kung Fu, obviously, which can be roughly translated into English as hard work. And so I call it Drafu because drawing requires a lot of work, especially imaginative drawing. So the four chambers you have to walk through and conquer uh, when doing imaginative drawing is gesture, reference, memory, and design. So let's talk about each one. Gesture drawing is where everything begins. This is where emotion happens. This is where acting happens. This is where you're roughing out and placing things in space. You're, 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 you're playing. You uh, don't uh, construct anything. And it's very, 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 very critical uh, at this stage not to get caught up in construction and solidity and all that stuff. This is all about power, emotion, and physics. And let me show you some examples of what I mean. And by the time, and by the, by the time I'm done with all of this, I'm going to show you an example of me drawing something from my imagination so that you can see it all in action once I finish talking about these things. So here we have some gesture drawings and these are gesture drawings from the aforementioned uh, Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta, obviously, when he drawing from imagination, when he was going to start doing a painting, he didn't just start with a finished drawing. What he did, especially when it came to poses of characters, is he played around, he roughed them out, he he, he came up with multiple versions of poses. There was nothing necessarily solid and constructed about these things. It was mostly about gesture and power and, and trying to capture the, the essence of, of a pose. Uh, he obviously practiced this with pen and ink. But this is essentially what he used to how he start he started he would start drawings is just he would just draw these scribbles the notion again of the Kim Jong Gi uh, idea that you just start in one corner and keep going like I said this is not this is um, not the norm uh, the norm is where Frank Rosetta was where he would play around and really work out what he was going to do before he did it. So gesture is about discovery. It's about not drawing pretty. It's about playing around. It's about finding the thing. It's about being rough. It's about being having energy. And it's not about necessarily drawing solid. It's not about drawing cubes and squares and circles. Uh, it's not about that at all. It's about energy and power and physics. The next chamber you have to conquer is reference. Now, f when you're an observational artist, when you're really good at observational art, uh, you assume somehow that imaginative drawing doesn't require you to observe anything. That somehow you've just memorized everything. And we're going to be talking about memory in the third. But um, you have to first know what to memorize. And so what you do is you go through these steps of memorizing things. You have to, uh, even Kim Jong Gi, before he starts anything, he's said in interviews that he just takes out magazines and looks at stuff, and um, he's able to like just really study things and observe them and then take them in. But most of us would have to do multiple tries to to start memorizing things so here's an example i've been studying animals recently i've been studying how to draw uh, canines specifically and so my process was this i did uh, observational drawings of an actual canine skulls so these black and white uh, pen and ink drawings are observational drawings and then i would test myself by 
not putting the, the skulls away, not putting my reference away, but by taking what I, I've understood and testing myself and then redrawing it from my imagination in a different position while still looking at the skull. But the skull that I was looking at wasn't in this position, it was in a different position. I would only look at it just to make sure that I'm getting the details okay. As I developed, as I played around, I still had the skull open, but I would look at it a little bit less and less because the idea of doing that is to start making construction notes. I like observing things like where does this part of the jaw, this little part here of the jaw, line up with the eye socket? and things like that like the uh, one of the observations was that in a, a in the dog skull the the eye socket doesn't connect it's got a big open gap front of the eye socket came down to this bottom part of the jaw and that's where i knew that right in between was where it turned up and then it, it turned away and then also where it went forward so this kind of like muzzle part what lined up with the front of the jaw and then here i also noticed that the jaw the that the that the cheekbones actually slanted down. So I even wrote down, down, and I put an arrow here. Uh, I said, it doesn't connect here. I would put this line here that it comes down here. Like, where does the jaw, the bottom of the jaw right here, where does it line up compared to the eye socket? Things like that. And then I made, no I made a note of that. And then I would, little by little, I would look at less, less, and less the actual skull. And I would be able to turn it because I was making associations. I was making uh, memory is, uh, well, I'll talk about memory later, but I started practicing from reference to start memorizing stuff. So reference first, reference, what does it look like? For example, if you don't know what a fire hydrant looks like, you're going to have to look it up, especially because it's possible that fire hydrants uh, look different in different places. Uh, in this case, most of the fire hydrants in this reference uh, look exactly the same, except for this one. This one's got a shorter head, but in general, fire hydrants have seem to have a very clear formula. They have a big thing here and two little T's here, and so then from that point on, you can you draw it once or twice, and then you're able to to memorize. Or, or, or remember what a fire hydrant looks like. But first, you have to look at what it is. If you want to draw dogs, for example, you also need to know what type of dog. There are so many types of dogs, you can't just draw a generic dog. You have to look at what type of dog you're going to want to make or draw. If, for example, you're going to draw somebody wearing a shirt, what kind of shirt? Is it a button-down shirt? Does it have a symbol on it? For the most part, T-shirts are all generally the same. For the most part, button-down shirts are generally the same, but uh, there are slight variations uh, depending on how tight they are or how loose they fit. Uh, so it, it it does help, especially if you're drawing. It, it, with men's clothes, it's a little bit easier. With women's clothes, the fashion is so unique and changes all the time that you need to look that stuff up all the time. Okay, and so... For example, also, you need to draw a truck, for example. And then, uh, what kind of truck? There, look how many types of trucks there are. There are flat front trucks. There are long front trucks. There are giant ones with giant beds or square ones. I hear this one's softer. This one's got a thing up on, on, on its top. Um, uh, the, this weirdo, I don't know what the heck that is. Uh, but and then, so, there are different types of trucks. There are different types of measurements. So, you do need reference you need to at least be able to know what it is that you're drawing and then have and start from there it's always good to have reference you don't need to have memorized the entire world it's okay to actually have something to look at and about and and, and 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 work off of and work from uh, you, you you're not required to have uh, a photographic memory and eidetic memory again with trees you can have the exact same thing with trees trees are different every time will it have leaves when it will not have leaves is it a birch tree is it a pine tree is it a uh, oak tree is it a uh, every kind of tree is a little bit different every type of tree is a little bit different so it's always good to have 
reference. Reference is your friend. That leads us to memory. So I was saying about my memorization of, of, of the dog. Uh, again, using reference first, I looked at the reference and then I really just practice drawing what I see from observation as clearly and as cleanly as I possibly can. The reason you do this first, trying to get the, the reality down for real, is because by doing that, you may find things that you may have missed if you were not studying it as real as you can, as, as, as accurately as you can. Um, at the end of the day, you're not going to be asked to memorize all these. I'm not going to memorize all these bones, but there are things that I learned when copying, when doing observational stuff and doing a direct copy of bones and muscles and, and things like that, that I would never have realized had I not done it. Then once I finish doing all the observational stuff, then I start coming up with a slightly more simple version of the, of the skeleton, a formula for the skeleton that allows me to, one, keep the anatomy generally intact, but at the same time not have to memorize every single bone in a, its absolute perfect shape. And so I chose very simple things, especially with this hip bone. Really, I could just create a flat a flat uh, shape here and it'll react like the hip bone but the most important thing was getting for example the size of the scapula how far up above the rib cage does it go how far down the rib cage does it go and it appears to go halfway in between and halfway in between is also how long the pelvis bone actually goes it's not bigger than that it stays about that way and on top of that it slants extremely it ex it's an extreme slant so as you can see it slants extremely and then if you line it up so you could see that it goes right through here these two things line up these line up these generally line up here so these are the things that I was making a note of when I was trying to to draw also the rhythm of the of the of the spine how does the spine work how do these things bend what would it look like from behind uh, and then here I was actually trying hard to to come up with a good general shape for these a simple shape for the bones so that I and and the rhythm for these bones and the more I did it the more questions I had the to answer uh, where does the spine connect to the skull? Uh, the, here's the rhythms of the bones that I actually ended up uh, concluding that, that, that the bones come in here. And then there's like a kind of a rhythm up here in the, during the connection and it comes back down. So um, here I had it wrong and then I fixed, my, fixed it and I, uh, it just seemed a little odd that, um, that it, it just had two bumps like this. And then I realized that no, it has this rhythmical kind of lyrical thing, which is very natural and that's the way things tend to be in nature so these all of these drawings are from my imagination after uh, the all of these drawings are from my imagination so uh, I started to memorize it now I could draw this general version of the skeleton from memory because of all the research and that that I did trying to over and over and over writing notes what lines up with what how does it line up uh, where does it move? How does it move? That sort of thing. So that's where memory comes in. Um, you do that with things that you know you're going to draw a ton of. And finally, probably one of the most mysterious parts of drawing from your imagination is design. And design, when I talk about design, I mean what I tend to talk about in the drawing website, in my website where I teach drawing. In the drawing website, I talk about design and design is the secret sauce. So for example, say you're drawing from your imagination and all your drawings seem to be kind of ugly. Uh, they're kind of realistic and, and, and things like that, but something about them are just, they're just not very appealing. You're lacking appeal, you're lacking uh, uh, 
beauty in, in, your, in your drawing. The reason your stuff doesn't look as pretty as it could is because you haven't been practicing the principles of design. And design is all about making things interesting. Design is, in fact, style. It's another way of saying style. Uh, the reason I say this is because in, in, in the animation industry, we get character designers. Character designers are style designers. They create styles for shows. They take the principles of design, they play around with, they mishmash them all together, and then they come out with something brand new, clean, different for any specific show, or not so different. Sometimes they kind of, all, some shows kind of look like other shows. There's like a Disney style, there's like a, like a Cartoon Network style, and that sort of thing. Well, those are all because of the design rules spe specific for that look of a thing. When your work looks like everyone else's work, it's because your style is, your design is too similar to the design principles that are being used by someone else consciously or unconsciously. So, for example, when you're drawing more representational, there is these proportion measurements that are taught. Uh, people are eight heads tall, the, the, the brow cuts between halfway between this and then, and then the nose cuts between this and that and the whole and the, all these like measurements and all this other stuff. And then you keep using the same thing over and over. By the time you're done and there's a bunch of people who learn all these proportions, you end up with everybody's stuff looking kind of the same because they're using the exact same proportions. And this is in humanity. Uh, and these are just kind of general proportions. These are just the ideal proportions. It isn't until you start varying or uh, veering away from these generic ideal proportions that people start looking more unique. Design has a little something to do with that. How far you veer away from the generic proportions, how close you stick to them, how much you play around and balance all these, uh, harmonizing the balance of the proportions and the contrast of different spaces and proportions, like all of this stuff is important. It makes your stuff look unique or, and it makes your stuff look appealing depending on how you put these pieces together. And design also has to do not only with character, but with composition, with the way you space things in a composition. So that too has, has a lot to do designing a, a picture plane, what you're gonna do here, where you're gonna place that over here, how are, are the large shapes and the, the small, smaller shapes contrasting with the harder edges and the softer edges. Uh, design also has to do with the type of line quality you do. Is it straights versus curves? Is, is it uh, C curves versus S curves versus curves with just straights with all the all these things all together. Design is in everything. It's, 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 in, it's in motion when dancers dance. It, they're designing motion, contrast and balance and all this. Uh, in, in martial arts, you're doing the same thing when you're doing forms. Uh, in music, you also is is designed because of the of the contrast between the slower parts and the higher parts and the tempo and the contrast between certain notes and where to to make it bombastic and where not to make it bombastic. Where is it going to be silent? When is it going to not be silent? And, and things like that, like putting all these things, harmonizing all these things together, is designed. So it's extremely extremely important to be aware of the design, the your choices, the the, the the types of design choices you like and the chi type, type of design choices you do not like. And when you put them all together, you come up with your own voice. So one of the frustrations is that you can draw from your imagination, but your stuff doesn't look unique or interesting or you don't like it. It's because you don't know design principles well enough to play around and discover and find what it is that you want to say and how you want to say it. And so I I talk about all of these things in my draw in my drawing website in three different chapters. The stick figures, 
basic design. So I, I, I just kind of introduce this whole entire notion of design. Then I talk about design using flat graphic shapes, which is extremely important, especially when you're designing characters and you're designing compositions. And then once you're done with the flat graphic representation, then you also have to design your character in three dimensions and how does the contrast and shape and all this other stuff of design principles work in a character that not only works as a flat graphic, but also works in three dimensions using three dimensional forms. So I talk about all of these things in the three chapters on design on my website. So now I've decided that I'm going to very quickly show you what I mean when you put it all together. And I don't know exactly what I'm going to draw. I'm going to just start something. It's and um, I, I, I well, I, I sort of kind of know what I'm going to draw because I did upload my reference. My reference is characters that I personally designed myself for a comic that I'm going to be doing. And I think I'm going to draw her. I decided I was going to draw her. So uh, it, it took me a long time. Uh, character design is not something that is easy for me at all. It's always, always a struggle. So I really don't. Uh, um, I find it very, very difficult to do for all the reasons I said about, about design. Uh, knowing the design principles, all this other stuff. How can I make myself look unique and all this other stuff. And you, I, I, I'm personally not sure if I've quite come up with my own voice yet, but... As you will see, I'm going to kind of veer away from this particular design because I'm still playing around with the notion of this character. So I do have this character here. She's wearing very specific uh, blouse and she's wearing very specific pants and very specific types of shoes as opposed to these characters who are wearing completely different types of shoes, different types of, of boots here, and then we got a different type of, uh, of shoe here. She's this one is wearing the same type of pants very similar at least uh, she's there she's wearing jeans but they're black she's wearing jeans but they're blue but she's wearing a belt and she's not wearing a belt and, and you know little things like that she's wearing a tank top she's not wearing a tank top uh, she's wearing like this kind of a vest thing she's wearing German army pants from World War two uh, and she's African-American, things like that. I looked up reference about for everything, like what they're going to be wearing, how does it look like when somebody wears that, or different body types, things like that. It was it was a lot of research, a lot of, and then, and then after I had enough research, then I started playing around with shapes, and then I started trying to discover something. So design is very important. But now that I have her just kind of standing there doing nothing, at least I have something to go off of. So this is my reference. The first thing I have to do is come up with a gesture drawing. What I am going to draw. So I don't start drawing the, all the solid structures and uh, the tubes and the, and the balls and the boxes and, and all that stuff. That comes in the next step. That comes in later. The most important part when starting a drawing is coming up with how you're going to, one, break up the, the picture plane, how you're going to break up the space, the blank page, similar to a, pain, a painter trying to cover up uh, a lot of the white in the canvas so they have something to start, start on that isn't so distracting. It's similar to that when you are doing gesture drawing. You're just trying to break up the picture plane if you're going to draw a whole vignette or if you're going to just come up with an interesting pose, then you need to start just playing and playing until you find something that uh, that you want. Now, you may have something in your mind or not, and it's not, not, let me repeat, not required that you know where you're going before you start. You don't need to. You could start playing on the page and discover it on the page. So that's what I'm going to start doing right now. So I, as I was talking, my brain was kind of going, and then I was thinking that maybe I could start something where she is maybe escaping something, like she's running away, and she's looking back. So here's her neck, here's her shoulders. She's looking back this way. The computer needs to catch up to me. Okay, here we go. She's... Here's her hand. This is her arms. 
maybe this way. There you go. Yeah, I like that. Maybe she's being surprised. Why not? She's turning her head. Maybe her hair is going this way. Uh, so uh, what I'm really doing here is just playing. Maybe her arm is this way instead. Let's see what happens. No, I don't like that. Maybe her arm is like this. I don't like that. Lower her arm. I'm coming at us in perspective. Yeah, maybe. So again, this is just uh, and then so I'm also thinking okay is she is she in motion is she not in motion is her hair turning this way because it's windy or is it because she's in motion or is it because she just turned around really fast and her hair's just catching up to her I'm not sure let me see um, so I've run out of paper here Uh, where's her center of gravity? So you're kind of thinking logically about stuff too. You know, you're, is, if her hips are like this. Yeah, I think this is okay for now. This is just, you know, an example anyway of what, I, what I'm talking about. So you don't have to come up. If, if, if I didn't like this, if I decided, well, you know what? Maybe it might be better if... Uh, if she wasn't, if we didn't have that, maybe it's more casual. Maybe she's just kind of um, leaning on, uh, against a bar, and her shoulders up, and she's leaning up, and she's she has a drink in her hand. She kind of looks like Bugs Bunny at the bar in that uh, western that he was in with uh, Yosemite Sam, I believe. She could do that too. Here's her hair. Okay, so I could do that. Maybe she has to go reach for something really high up. Because you can't get to it. Maybe there's a, a cookie jar or so it depends on what you're what you want. Uh, you're you're kind of just playing finding the the shapes the thing that 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 says what you want it to say let's go back to this because it's just interesting and at this point in the drawing process i would start refining so let's just say that we're going to keep this i'm going to reduce the opacity here just as if uh, i used a kneaded eraser to kind of lighten the drawing and then I would have to start coming up with the construction, the anatomy, that sort of thing. Now that I've got the gesture, this is where all your knowledge about, so, so all your draftsmanship knowledge comes in. This is where the figure drawing comes in. This is where your anatomy drawing comes in. This is where all the practice that you've done doing all these observational things come in. And this is where your memory you're memorizing of the muscles, the masses, the shapes, because you, the same way that you saw me memorize the dog shapes and stuff like that, you also have to do with the human skull, the human skeleton, the human muscles. Uh, if you memorized, for example, 
the formulas put forth by George Bridgman in his book, and you're able to turn those things in space, and you've practiced those, and you've memorized those formulas, um, having them uh, on your on your table first, and then uh, in front of you first, and then just kind of first copying them, and then drawing them from your memory, and checking yourself, and then little by little, you just it just becomes part of the way you draw. Well, I have done that, so I am going to start drawing this character a little bit more solid. Now I may not go through the whole thing but I just want to go through this step and show you the step. So there's a little bit of Loomis in here. There's a little bit of Steve Houston figure drawing in here. There's a little bit of a little bit a lot of Bridgman in here. There's going to be a lot of, of, of everything that I've ever studied. There's a little bit of Riley method in what I'm doing. And so it's it's just years of memorizing and deliberate memorizing and practicing and re and re practicing and uh, reiterating and reconstructing and stuff like that. So uh, I drew hundreds and hundreds of eyes from memory on purpose, drawing the same eye over and over and over until I could do it. Now this character's eyes are really, really big, and I'm already not drawing her eye. Her eye is supposed to be bigger than this, so I'm going to draw her eyes bigger. If this was on paper, I would just simply erase it and draw it bigger. So like I said, um, I'm going to change her design a little bit at, even as I go because I've been doing a lot of drawing on my in my sketchbook. I've been playing around with these characters designs specifically and so I'm going to I'm, I, I'm still debating with myself about how I want to draw these characters. I thought I had decided what these characters would actually look like, but as I go along, I find I keep changing my mind. But I do want to keep a lot of the same shapes here, so that it, so that I know myself that that's who. So that, to me, this is there's specific things that should be in her design. Like this kind of square shape. Also, um, the notion here is that her forehead is, is, is a little bit bigger. So I'm going to move her entire eye structure down to accommodate for a little bit more forehead. gonna open her mouth it's just much more interesting if her mouth is a little bit open and notice I'm not drawing clean again that's another thing I'm not this is not a final the, f the final drawing in fact this is just a secondary rough Her 
eyelashes and then her bottom eyelashes and then this will be cut about there You could play around with the shape design of her eyebrows. Here's the muscle here. Here's the, the shoulder blades. Here's the hairline. I'm going to draw the hairline for myself so that I know where her hair begins and where it ends. And again, anything that is not where it ought to be, I'm going to keep moving it around, playing around. This is not set in stone, and it probably won't be set in stone even after I put a final line on it because I can still give myself the option of vetoing it and changing my mind even after I do a final line. And I keep pushing and pushing and pushing her hair, her her. The side, that this side of the face more and more and more until like um, it, it's a process it's a process this isn't I'm not Kim Jong Gi I'm not gonna just draw something uh, final at the end okay now critical one of the critical parts here is the is the uh, hair uh, on a woman there are two extremely critical parts especially on the face to get one you have to get the face especially if she's supposed to be a young pretty lady you have to get her face right right you have to make her look young and pretty the other critical part about drawing a pretty lady is getting the frigging hair right like get the darn hair right and oftentimes the hair is more work is the most amount of work that like this is the hair is where all the work is at like you're not gonna you're gonna be mostly drawing hair and it has to be beautifully designed so this is where design comes in straights versus curves versus you know lyric lyrical stuff like like what's an interesting hair shape hair mass how do I make this look beautiful and cute where do these things connect what type of hair is it is it curly hair is it and, and this this particular hair is extremely curly so once you get a generally decent hair mass Then you're gonna give it the texture it needs. And I, I'm doing it kind of rough here because I know that when I'm gonna add some ink to this, and the ink is going to do a lot of the work for me. So I'm just kind of indicating some of the some of the, the, the direction I want to take the hair but it needs to be curly her hair is curly so I gotta make sure to be clear that her hair is got beautiful these beautiful curls and it's extremely tricky okay and then her pecs rib cage right rib cage pectoral muscles come in out from underneath the shoulder muscles here's the biceps like tricep and then it comes down here with the muscles of the forearm the bone is boxy comes out here the wrist is boxy as per Bridgman the, the 
bicep muscles tend to be kind of boxy. If you look at Bridgman, that's what he does. This is coming in in perspective to us. Like this is 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 moving forward in in three dimensions. Like this. Avoiding symmetry, we need to make sure that this and these this side over here isn't exactly uh, the Michelin Man kind of. The biceps come in here. There's a bone that sticks out here. This comes from observation and making a note of that from observation. The hand, probably the most difficult thing to draw outside of the face and the body itself. I'll just indicate something here. I do a gesture of the hand in the, in the fingers. Same thing here. Just the gesture. I'm not drawing all the construction yet. The breasts. She has big bosom. Rhythmically connected here. That's a very Riley method thing. She tends to have big, big hips very wide hips we are going to not draw the rest of this here we'll just leave that blank because we need to deal with these darn fingers whoops First the bone, and the gesture. Got the knuckles. This is just my shortcut to drawing fingers. From having done it so much. Actually so well. I tend to ideally what, what I tend to do is I like taking pictures of my hand my hands when I'm drawing hands. That's like my favorite way of drawing hands. That way there's no question I got the hand looking as accurate as I can. Just makes life easier too. It's not cheating. You're still drawing it. It's just who wants to deal with having to draw hands perfectly. I mean you can I could still do it without it, but it's so much so much easier when you just take a darn picture. Okay, so we'll just leave that like this for now, and then um, I'll show you what I do at the end. So this is from my imagination. Again, this is an imaginative. Uh, so I start with gesture, then I add the structure, then I have, but I have my mem my reference, and then you saw me do the an anatomy and all this other stuff from memory. You saw the design. Here's the design. This is how I des I redesigned her, made her nose a little bit more solid. This one I don't have a nose at all here. Well, here I actually gave her nostrils. I mean, she doesn't. She's only got a bridge of one nose here. Well, I actually gave her nostrils in this, and I think that it's she's much prettier with an actual nose. And then when you do the final ink line, 
what you're doing is you are and um, I think I'm going to do this in vector line uh, the, when you're doing the final ink line what you're doing is this uh, doing putting in the final design for your drawing right you, you are making the final line decisions I'm using red still I don't want to use red So now I'm making design decisions with each individual line. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be thicker, this is going to be thinner. Um, the, the idea here is you're making uh, beauty of variation at its, at its uh, most minute level. And because this is all rough, see, I, I don't like that line. I'd rather have it like that. And because this is rough, um, you still be, you have to make the final decision. Which of the bazillion rough lines is the right one? because it is rough you don't stop making decisions see I have to make this decision here I'm gonna break up the eye so that it matches the other eye there's a it's extremely rough here so I can't really tell what I what is happening so I've got to cl clarify what is happening by actually making some choices here And I hope I made the right choices. And this needs to turn. How do I turn this? Um, it, this is uh, a lot of the the decisions I'm going to have to make with the hair are going to be easier to make would have been easier to make if this was on pa in paper on paper up
Not 100% sure that's accurate. Let me delete some of that there. It just needs to feel right to me. Okay, and then this hair. How do I do this? Uh, I'm used to doing this with with my with a brush. But I'm not sure how to do this digitally. This is kind of very similar to what I do, how it works with the brush. So this isn't bad, actually. I'm glad I'm experimenting with this. It's helping. Uh, the, the tricky part for me is that I'm, I'm eventually, when I do this comic, it's going to mostly be drawn digitally and because um, it's just just easier. It'll, be, it'll make it easier on me um, having to, if I need to make changes, etc. But I'm so used to doing things traditional with traditional brushes and things like that, that um, some of the effects that I can get using traditional tools I haven't solved using digital tools. This is wrong. I don't like it. Again, I, I, I'm, it's, it's about design. You're, 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 you're designing things and this is supposed to be curly. And I'm not making it curly. Supposed to be curls. You're kind of seeing me also practice my uh, uh, doing uh, character design fixes and, and just doing experiment, uh, character experimentation here. Because here's the tricky part, too. Her shirt's black. If I'm drawing this curly hair, which is going to be all black, and then her... Um, 
her um, eyebrows are black, her pupils are black, her eyelashes are black. This is going to be extremely tricky. Go back to the pen that I was using. I'm going to connect this stuff because I want to see what happens. If I apply a lot of black. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here we go. So I'm going to drop black in here. I don't know what it's going to look like. It's just one giant experiment. That's another thing, again, when you're doing imaginative stuff. If you're taking risks a lot of the time. It's one giant. It's an experiment. And it's okay. And it's okay if things don't turn out. You have to be okay with that. But the trick is to find out why it didn't turn out and then learn from it and then make adjustments. So now we've got that. What do I do with the... Ooh, that neck suddenly doesn't look okay. In fact, it looks terrible. So let me fix it. Still doesn't look okay. I think it's because my shoulders aren't are broken. I think her shoulders are broken. Remember how I said I reserve the right to change my mind? And even after I do the final has reserved the right to fix anything that is It didn't work this out well enough anatomically. I just kind of glossed it over. Now it's coming to bite me in the butt.
So the tricky part here is that she's, like I said, wearing a black shirt. Oops. Yeah, that was wrong. I forgot. I didn't ink all of this. see this isn't connected Okay, so it looks okay. Everything seems to get lost in here. But I don't like it like that. Maybe all it needs is a self-ink line. This shoulder is ridiculous. It looks ridiculous. Doesn't it look ridiculous? It looks ridiculous. Especially in silhouette, you could really see it. You could really see that it's just off. Okay, let's try that again. That feels much better.
Yeah. And now, uh, again, self-incline. Let's try that again with the self-incline. Oops. This needs to go back to this here. I'm very quiet about this. I'm concentrating on all the stuff I'm doing, so you have to forgive me about that. It's sort of bright, I suppose. So that helps. The, the, the problem and the tricky part when going off and not doing the traditional anatomically proportioned type of character is that you sometimes get into situations like, like the one that I've got here, where usually what the measurement is from the nostril all the way up is the tear duct. Nostril all the way up is a tear duct. 
when you're doing a cartoon character that kind of doesn't even have nostrils, for example, or one that's got a small and gigantic eyes, etc., um, the tricky part is where. how do you even measure where her eyes should begin, where it doesn't begin. Does it work? Does it not work? That sort of thing. And in the case of this character, it seems to me that it's it's kind of too, her eyes seem to be a little bit too far in that direction here and I want to move them and maybe even shrink them And now I'm going to make the adjustments. Or not. I don't think that works at all. I'm not sure why this mono brush isn't working the way I want it to. It's giving me weird scars, I guess. And then this eye could be better as well.
Just subtle adjustments. Yeah, maybe. A little bit of texture here, but not too much. Okay, so uh, that's, that's a bit of a quick sketch. Uh, general process, you saw me do everything from beginning to end. You saw the, the theory behind it. I talked about the, uh, all the, the principles that I was using when coming up with this drawing. So uh, right back to where, uh, to what we were talking about beginning with gesture. You saw me begin with the gesture drawing, which was this. And then uh, I had my reference, which was this. And then um, I used my, the memory, uh, my memory of construction, solidity, anatomy, uh, Riley method, and uh, Steve Houston, um, Glenn Vilpu, uh, that sort of thing. These artists, these teachers that I've had, um, figure drawing uh, experience, memory of doing that, uh, construction, gesture, um, uh, using Bridgman, um, all the anatomy studies that I've ever done, things like that, all of that. The memory stuff comes in and I just start plugging and plugging and plugging away and that memory stuff isn't just I took a look at it and then I memorized it no I, it was repetition 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 uh, f uh, testing myself and then repeating and then testing and looking and repeating and testing and looking and repeating and doing that for hours and hours and hours over and over and over every single day um, which uh, led me to everything here is just experience uh, memory doing stuff like that and, etc and then finally design and design being a uh, line quality uh, shape design um, character design um, spacing and placing uh, uh, knowing what type of, of lines to use knowing uh, how, how am I going to place the blacks is it going to is it still going to be clear and things like that all everything that I've done every single choice that I've made was a design choice so that is the four chambers, the drafu four chamber, the four chambers of imaginative drawing. 
I hope you found this informative. I hope you found this helpful. I would like to thank all of my patrons who have supported me. I appreciate them so much. I encourage you to join them in supporting me if you enjoy this kind of information that I'm providing. Um, it, it's really helpful for me, encouraging me to continue to do stuff like this, but also because uh, it helps my family. And for that, I am extremely grateful. So uh, thank you, Aaron Garcia, Ahobo, Anastasia, uh, Bill Fisher, Bill Munier, uh, Benny, Brett, Brooke Brown, uh, Chanel Winya, uh, Duran Rivera, Eric Prestman, Eric Salham, uh, Gallo Viking, George, George Crawford, Heather, Hyla Lacefield, Ingrid Hayek, Ken Dirks, Lynn, Madeline Dupreez, Mary Charowitz, Michael Rasmussen, Nathan Siebold, Paul Nass, Rain, Richard Anthony, Shopping for Noobs, Sterling A. Brooks, Steve Howard, Steve R., Tamara M. Cotton, Tim Bazarath, Tim John, Ulf Meyer, William Bell, and Young Stormlord. Thank you so much for being my patrons, and I will see you next time. All right, bye.